and um and since that time he has been um, um over 20 years here right okay um working uh, on uh, international epidemiological studies on infectious agents and cancer and now he works in the realm of early detection prevention and infection where he's um, deputy Uh, papers is witnesses uh, how productive uh, get are joining online so yeah um understand the causal link between infectious types um, to understand the to these infections, uh, to move on to discuss some of the parts so my outline of the talk will be in two main program at IARC, which is like it's which is how we calculate the gl the global S Look at them one by one. I won't. So, currently improving its worldwide estimates of the, the fraction of cancers that is caused because of cases of cancers, and increasingly the the incidence rates of cancer. Infections are highly amenable to prevention. Um, everybody wants to be rid of their infections. Um, opportunities for vaccination, uh, diagnostic screening tests. Indeed, uh, therapies uh, against these infections. Surrogate of the preventable or the, or the So how do, um, um, so this, for building these estimates that I'm going to talk to you about. Part one is the of the, of the of the summer school. The rely a lot on the IARP monograph in the monograph 100B. I'll talk about. And then once we know that um, cancers are multidisciplinary causes, and so we're interested in having a uh, population attributable to these agents. And we uh, this this piece of work. The, and data and the correct statistical methodology to, to, to calculate these population attributable. In applying those to the global cancer statistics, which is something else that is a and hear a, a lot about here, um, which particularly based around the global Cam project and some industries around the world. We've, this has been published over the many years with improved um, and so forth, for which the last um, publication was in.
Atlantic. The, the, my uncle, my, 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 they, and the, the group of experts that got together in 2009 highlighted. a number of agents, a number of viruses, including um, many high-risk HPV types, hepatitis B and C virus, Epstein-Barr virus, um, Carposi sarcoma herpes virus, which we call, also call HHV8, um, herpes, herpes virus 8, um, um, HTVL1, uh, a number of parasites. Um, I won't talk much more about the parasites. They're quite local um, problems in different geographical areas of the world. And then lastly, another virus, which I've kept separately, which is the HIV. Um, and the reason I've kept it separately from the other viruses is because it's not a direct carcinogen. But through its um, uh, immune deficiency, um, uh, it does worsen the outcome of all the other agents that we got listed above. So um, though we know the agents and what cancers they cause. And here in this, in this, um, in this uh, slide, I'm showing you estimates for the population attributable fraction the population the, the, how much we think of this these cancer sites is due to these agents for each um, infectious and cancer pair so you can see we have a lot of associations that we consider a causal a couple of things i want you to take from this um this this slide is first of all you can see some types such as papillomavirus hpv causes a quite a broad range of um cancer types Whereas some of the associations are much uh, more uh, specific, such as um, Carposi sarcoma virus and, and, and Carposi sarcoma, which is really something that's much, which might, the, 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 there's a, the, the agent only causes really one, one type of cancer. I also would like you to notice that the, 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 the attributable fraction ranges from cancers, cancer infection um, associations that are necessary causes, so like 100% of all cervixes due to HPV. We also consider 100% for this, for this work, 100% of squamous cell carcinoma of the anus is, is due to HPV, 100% of Carposi sarcoma linked to the Carposi sarcoma virus. So we have very strong associations. And then other associations such as papillomavirus, HPV, and laryngeal cancer, Cancer, larynx cancer, with only a very small proportion that is caused by these, uh, these, this agent uh, and has uh, many other risk factors. And also notice where there's a little star in this population attributable fractions means that we even believe we have evidence that the, the, the proportion of these cancers that are caused by these agents is variable geographically and we also try to take that into account in our estimates. So when we apply those population attributable fractions to the global burden of cancer, this is the main results. 2.2 million cases in terms of looking at absolute numbers are, are considered to be attributable to those in infections worldwide every year, of which that is 13% of all cancers. The main um, burdensome uh, carcinogenic infection for cancer is Helicobacter pylori, 810 thousand cases estimated uh, uh, globally annually, mostly due to stomach cancer, papillomavirus 690,000 followed by hepatitis B and hepatitis C with, with these numbers that you can see here and another of other um, a, a types uh, of, of, of infections that I've grouped together for simplicity here. So when we look at the overall infection attributable cancer burden across the world, we can look at it in two in, in different ways. One way to do it is to look at it on the top left here is in as in a fraction of all cancers. So how much of all cancer can be um, considered to be um, due to infection? And you can see in that presentation, it is very high in, in sub-Saharan Africa. A large proportion of all cancers are due to infection in sub-Saharan Africa and, and, and indeed in Asia. But of course, um, Sometimes when we, but that, that takes into account, um, doesn't really take into account differences in age to structure, neither the variation in incidence of other types of cancer. So sometimes what, what's more interesting when we, when we want to compare the incidence of particular um, infectious agents and their, uh, the, can, the cancers that they cause across the world, we try to switch that to age standardized cancer incidence due to that infection. So here on the right, on the, on this, um, graph here, we see the age standardized incidence rate 
for all infection cancers um, compared on, on a global global scale on, to, on a standard on a standard um, scale. And again, but you can still see that we, we see very high rates of infection and attributable cancer in general in still sub-Saharan Africa and, and, and Eastern Asia, and much lower rates in in, in areas of high income settings such as Europe, North America, uh, and Oceania. So in this graph, I'm now zooming into those four main, um, four main uh, ca uh, infection uh, and cancer causing infections, and just showing you that those, in, in those, how those incidence rates of cancers caused by these agents vary around the world. So here you see on the right hand side on, on the map, and on the left hand side, you can see um, the incidence rates due to these um, agents uh, by broad geographical area and split by um, males and females. So for example, to zoom through quickly, Helicobacter pylori, you see particularly high rates in Eastern Asia and everywhere around the world higher in men than in women. Um, HPV, very different pattern. First of all, strong um, association with, with, with female cancer, because it's driven by cervical cancer and particularly high in, in sub-Saharan Africa rather than other places of the world. Hepatitis B, again, a strong concentration in uh, Eastern Asia. Of, indeed, 70% of all burden of cancer due to hepatitis B virus occurs in China alone, primarily driven by um, liver cancer. And again, on the left, you can see that HPV-related cancer, always higher burden uh, incidence in, in men th than women. Hepatitis C virus uh, has a more patchy distribution around the world, and that's because it's, um, some, it's, it's uh, spread through unsafe needle use, and, and often it is related to epidemics um, through, through um, uh, medical system um, uh, contamination at a, at a large level. So you can see particular countries such as Egypt and Mongolia that flags up here that has very, uh, has high, very high rates, but there's, there's not a regionality so much to hepatitis C. So in the next couple of slides, I'm just going to do zooming in to each one of these agents separately. So Helicobacter pylori, attributable cancer, um, cancer uh, particularly driven by, by stomach cancer. And we already mentioned that a large part of the burden is, is, is in, in Eastern Asia and Asia alone. So we have a very strong causal association for a long time known between chronic infection with Helicobacter uh, uh, bacteria, bacteria and, and non-cardiogastric cancer. And, in, and more recently, we've also known that if there's also an association with cardiogastric cancer, particularly in those uh, Asian populations where there's a high burden. Uh, due to the natural disappearance of Helicobacter pylori uh, all around the world, age-specific incidence of gastric cancer is slowly decreasing. Um, however, it's not going to go away for a while, and absolute numbers of cancers due to, due to Helicobacter pylori and gastric cancer is actually still rising just due to the, just due to the aging of the population. So there is still a huge amount of uh, prevention work to be done, and a, prom a most promising public health strategy for preventing gastric cancer is eradication of Helicobacter pylori with antibiotics. Uh, ongoing trials, mostly in Asia, are expected to show significant impact of um, helicobacter pylori testing and treatment on, uh, on reducing gastric cancer risk. And so now we're really in a phase of locally adapted implementation strategies um, needed to be evaluated, in the, particularly in those high risk areas for gastric cancer for, for helicobacter pylori, pylori test and treatment. HPV now. Uh, difficult this different geographical presentation and just to remind us what of those those types those cancers caused by hpv so um i think as we all know very well cervical cancer uh, is contributing by far the, the 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 majority of the burden of hpv related cancer worldwide so, and you can see here at the bottom 600 of that 690,000 um uh, cancers caused by HPV are in fact cervix, where it causes 100% of all cervical cancers. Um, 100, we also um, consider HPV to cause all of anal scale squamous cell carcinoma, adds another 30,000 worldwide. And HPV also contributes to a proportion, but not all, of these other cancer sites, vulva, vagina, penile cancer. And head and neck cancers, which has a very high bar here because it's a very common cancer in, in the world, but only a small proportion of that is due to papillomavirus. And if we zoom into those head and neck cancer sites, which, which uh, we, really know, we can really notice that 
the HPV fraction of head and neck cancers is, is really the, the, the oropharyngeal um, anatomical site that is, that is more HPV associated. And this adds additional uh, numbers to that global burden of, of cancers. And, and also here you will see that most of that part of that attributable fraction that is due to HPV is due to this darker red section, which is HPV 16 and 18, particularly in the non-cervical um, sites. We have, over the years, we've accumulated a lot of data on, on cervical cancer um, because it's, it's, because it's a, unfortunately a very common cancer and, and we've done a lot of typing of HPV. So we can actually zoom in um, for cervical cancer even more extensively into the kind of types that actually cause the different um, cervical cancers. Um, and so the work on the left summarizes them, some uh, meta-analytical work done in, done in IARC and summarized in the, in the IARC handbook of cancer prevention that was published recently. But just to say that you can see HPV-16 accounts for 60% for or more of all cervical cancer and HPV-18 for another 15%. So three quarters of all um, cervical cancers just due to these two types that are clearly priorities for, for vaccination and screening, which are the, underpin the two sort of pronged uh, underpinning, uh, underpinning the, the WHO global strategy to accelerate the elimination of of, of, of cervical cancer um, with many um, known to, uh, uh, tools um, that are known to be efficacious. In terms of cervical cancer screening, I'm not going to go too much into it here, but into the details, but I just want to recommend for those of you who are interested in the, in the, the performance of different ways of doing uh, cervical cancer screening, this, this, this handbook that I already mentioned, um, uh, uh, published by IARC two years ago, uh, where they uh, really evaluated many different methods to, 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 do, to prevent um, cervical cancer, uh, including conventional cytology, uh, v v uh, HPV, uh, VIA, etc. Um, and which the, one of the main outcomes was really that HPV, shifting to HPV DNA testing um, really is more performant than any of the other previously used screening methods. Uh, and it's a really good resource for, for students and, and for people working in the domain that really want to see how these methods compare to each other. That being said, there are still many um, coverage gaps for screening and there are really many implementation questions still do remain how to imp improve coverage and impact of e even these proven interventions for cervical cancer screening, particularly in low and middle income countries where the burden of cervical cancer is the highest. In terms of HPV vaccination, uh, very early trials showed very uh, encouraging results on, on efficacy of HPV 16 and 18 um, vaccines against, uh, against, uh, against HPV uh, disease. Now we are accumulated a lot of data about uh, how these vaccines are actually uh, impacting uh, impacting disease in populations post um, uh, interventions. So after five years, we've seen after five years post vaccination, we saw that we have evidence against uh, vaccines to reduce HPV prevalence in, in the cervix among girls, in the anus among girls, even in the genitals in boys. We have evidence of cross protection against HPV types that were not even targeted by the vaccine. So this is very, very encouraging. Herd immunity um, from for, against persons who were not even um, vaccinated because the, the, the reduction, the circulation of HPV in the populations. So very, very encouraging impact there. 10 years post vaccination in these earliest in, introducing countries, we now see we saw uh, evidence for reduction in, in, in high grade lesions in the cervix in vaccinated populations, again evidence, cross-type prote cross protection, herd immunity, and 15 years after the earliest countries introduced HPV vaccination, we are now starting to see um, through cancer registry data that we are actually seeing um, reduction in the impact of cervical cancer in, 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 in those, uh, those early introducing um, populations. However, 15 years after the, these, the, the first countries introduced HPV, uh, HPV vaccine coverage is still suboptimal uh, in many lower middle income countries, again, where the large burden of HPV related disease falls. So here, as of 2020, this gives the status of the, of the world introduction of HPV um, vaccination, um, good coverage in those high income areas of the world, North America, uh, uh, 
uh, Europe uh, and Oceania, but but in but lower you can see um, in the in the, number, the percentage of countries that have implemented in in Africa and Asia, uh, including um, countries where the burden is is very high, uh, and large countries such as India and China that have, to date have not got um, uh, country national nationwide um, programs in place yet. Um, one uh, big um, uh, shift in the potential uh, of uh, affordability and feasibility of introducing uh, uh, HPV vaccines in countries where they were, they were perhaps struggling in the past is increasingly evidence that a single dose of HPV vaccine will be similarly efficacious to two or three doses. Uh, and a large part of that data arose from, from IARC, the India study um, that has been led from IARC. Um, and indeed, uh, we have also been able to show just how, uh, how the benefits on, 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 uh, could of, of, of moving, shifting a country like uh, India to a single dose of HPV vaccine could have on, on, on cervical cancer incidence and in, indeed elimination in, in a big country such as, such as India. So this is something that could potentially be a game changer in speeding up the implementation of HPV vaccines around the world. And indeed, WHO now has a permissive um, recommendation to, to allow uh, also um, uh, single dose HPV in, in countries that, um, that wish to take that route and in fact the uk has just announced that they are shifting to to single dose as well as have many other as, as are increasingly other countries a focus now on hepatitis uh, the two viruses show quite different um global patterns uh, we also i also also mentioned hpv particularly in eastern asia and hepatitis b more 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 apache but something that's worth very important when we think about hepatitis virus and, and and morbidity and comorbidity is that not only cancer is important but also other liver diseases most notably cirrhosis so i i, I like this paper here that um estimated using a lot of iarc data um, the burden of all non-communicable diseases caused by infectious agents um, and on the left, you see the global mat um, looking at disability life years lost. So, I mean, this is a judgment of the extent of mortality and morbidity due to these infectious causes. Again, you see on the map that it's highest in, 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 in sub-Saharan Africa and, and, and Eastern Asia. But when we look at the, the, the types of um, pathetic, pathetic, uh, pathogens that are causing the most mort mortality and morbidity, you see that the hepatitis um, virus Goes, goes to the top of the list compared to Helicobacter pylori um, and, and hepatitis C moves above HPV in terms of the, the list I gave you for cancer. And that is because um, these viruses also cause a huge amount of cirrhosis and, and, and mortality through cirrhosis and, and chronic liver diseases, which is the, which is the NCD associated with the, the greatest amount of, of, of mortality um, uh, around, the, around the world. Um, and recognition of that uh, has also led to WHO global strategy to eliminate hepatitis even before that of that of cervical cancer. And the, the prevention tools that we have available and recommended are H a, a vaccination against hepatitis B vaccination, HPV, including at birth, uh, safe injection practices and, and safe blood transfusions, uh, indeed also to do with injections, but harm reduction among drug users. Uh, particularly for uh, circulation of hepatitis C. Treatment of chronic treatment of hepatitis B for which the, 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 the drugs are, remain quite expensive but are, are coming down in price. And, 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 the, revol and the treatment of, of hepatitis C has really been revolutionized. Um, so now we have the availability to, to have oral drugs against hepatitis C that without, without side effects that really that really um, cure the disease in a relatively short period of time, opening um, up very important uh, options to test and treat for this for this virus. Um, and we have very clear targets to reduce um, uh, infection with these with these viruses by by 90 percent by 2030 and 65% reduction in, in deaths. But these are WHO targets. And now I'd like to, like to shift to, to Epstein-Barr virus. Um, so the, the map that we have for Epstein-Barr virus and the numbers of, 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 of the, the amount of burden due to this virus that IARC uh, is judging is still, is still somewhat an incomplete picture. This is because, um, we, uh, and, but, but you can see here that there is still most of the, the incidence of, of, of cancer caused by this agent is in Southeast Asia. 
And, but this is taking into account the, 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 the association between ed, the EBV that's been known for a long time with na nasal pharyngeal carcinoma, Hodgkin lymphoma, and Burkitt lymphoma. We also know that um, EBV increasingly, we are understanding that it's associated with other non-Hodgkin lymphoma subtypes beyond Burkitt and, and Hodgkin. And this is more work needs to be done to, to calculate that, that burden. And also, I want to talk about gastric cancer, gastric adenocarcinoma, because since that last IARC monograph that I mentioned in 2009, there's been really strong evidence for EBV to be associated with a fraction of gastric adenocarcinoma. A lot of evidence came from this, um, the Cancer Genome Atlas research, where, where they did the characterization of a lot of um, gastric cancers and really saw a subset here due to EBV. So that's the red arrow coming off to the top of the left um, on the, on, over there, uh, 9%, they were judged um, in this study. Uh, here at IARC, we went on to do a meta-analysis of all the studies looking at EBV and gastric cancer, and we found similarities all around the world that about 7.5, 8% of all gastric cancers have evidence of, of EBV involvement. And so when you apply that 7.5% to, to the global numbers of gastric cancers worldwide, then you come up with another 81,000 EBV attributable gastric uh, attributable cancers to add to the to the, the burden that we that was really pre previously published so the burden of ebv attributable cancer does fall heavily on asia because that is where the na nasal pharyngeal carcinoma uh, is really uh, very focused and and that's also where gastric carcinoma is uh, also very uh, heavy and so you've got num about 250,000 um, annual cases of our of, of cancer are estimated to be due to EBV. And that's before yet including these other NHL subtypes of which uh, particularly the diffuse, le diffuse um, B cell lymphoma. So that, that we think we have an involvement of, of EBV. So the, the causality spectrum is expanding for EBV. In terms of um, prevention, uh, uh, in terms of nasal pharyngeal carcinoma in high risk areas, Detection of EBV antibodies and EBV DNA in the blood has been shown to have perf uh, favorable performance characteristics and to be cost effective for early detection um, on, and management of NPC. Uh, and this recent paper is some recommendations of a, of a consensus group on, on, on this topic. But increasingly, with these large numbers of, of, of EBV-related cancers, there is increasingly an investment case, of course, for primary prevention, EBV vaccine development, perhaps. Uh, these numbers of EBV-related cancers that do not yet include any other NHL subtypes are more than the number of cancers caused by hepatitis C. EBV also causes infectious mononucleosis, which is glandular fever, which is not associated with much more, more mortality. But more importantly, there's been really strong um, causal, causal evidence recently for linking EBV to, to multiple sclerosis. Um, and, and, and there are now at least three HPV vaccines in development, um, which has been given a boost uh, by, partly by, by COVID and also perhaps by this association with multiple sclerosis. And one of these vaccination vaccines includes um, uh, uh, an mRNA EBV vaccine in phase one trials by Moderna. So a sort of COVID um, type vaccine uh, approach. So the toolkit for EBV cancer prevention is also expanding. The last thing I want to talk about is human um, HIV, which is considered by I to be a, to be a carcinogen with sufficient or limited evidence for, another, for a number of um, these uh, infectious related types, um, including Kaposi sarcoma, which is uh, cervix, anus, non-Hodgkin lymphoma, and Hodgkin lymphoma, which all are known to have these underlying viral carcinogens. Uh, interestingly enough, HIV also cause, is, has, shows a very strong causality with conjunctiva cancer in sub-Saharan Africa, but we do not actually know the evidence of what is the underlying viral carcinogen in, in that cancer, which that's an interesting aspect. But when, when we look at um, putting together the data, at least on Kaposi sarcoma, cervix and anus, and look at the, the burden of additional cancer that can be attributable to HIV, and that wouldn't exist in the absence of HIV, um, you can see, of course, that the HIV attributable cancer rate is really um, specific and high in, in sub-Saharan Africa, where the, um, the burden of uh, HIV prevalence at the population level is, 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 is so high.
Um, in terms of uh, prevention, uh, there are uh, WHO Global NCD Action Plan does, include, does include cancer control among persons living with HIV. It's a particular focus on cervical cancer screening, uh, which is so important for this high-risk population. In terms of, um, I mean, in terms of the, the global burden, about 5% of the global burden occurs among people living with HIV. Uh, most most Kaupazi Sokama um, occurs in sub-Saharan Africa, and almost 70% of global Kaupazi Sarcoma uh, occurs in people living with HIV. So there's a very strong relationship between Kaupazi Sarcoma and, and, and HIV. Um, and most of it goes undiagnosed, uh, or it, it was diagnosed late. So really, um, they're, they're, we, need, we need better methods for, for Kaupazi Sarcoma, Sarcoma early diagnosis to reduce um, to reduce uh, morbidity and mortality from, the, from this cancer. Of course, primary prevention of HIV itself, which, uh, which is, which is, which is, which is uh, advancing and incidence rates of HIV are decreasing all around the world, including in sub-Saharan Africa, will of course reduce infection-related cancer burden as well, um, that, that, um, because, it's because of the worsening that HIV has. There are evidence building for another suspected causal association. So these are associations between infections and cancers that have not yet made it to the IARC sort of group one classification. Um, Merkel cell virus uh, is, is, I mean, if, you read, if we redid the classification now, I think it would make it as group one. Very tight relationship between um, Merkel, MCV and Merkel cell carcinoma, which is a quite rare carcinoma. Malaria uh, and, and a link to, to Burkitt lymphoma, perhaps in a cofactor co, co, co with EBV. The hepatitis C and B uh, probably uh, cause uh, beyond the liver cancer, also uh, a proportion of bile duct cancer. Hepatitis D virus is an interesting virus um, and, and, and worsens the, the, uh, the, the aggressivity of, of hepatitis B um, uh, by, by uh, hugely increasing the risk of, of hepatella so carcinoma in, in, the, in, in co infection. Uh, suggestions of relationships between salmonella and, and, and gallbladder is another outstanding request, research question that has not been completely decided upon. And as I mentioned a few times in this talk, the, the different non-Hodgkin non lymphoma subtypes uh, probably have um, different associations and, um, and, and, uh, and causality with, with a number of different um, uh, viruses that really need still quite a lot of, of working out on, on etiological fractions. So my key messages from the public from this Talk are, I think I hope to be able to have convinced you that there are strong geographical variations in the incidence of cancers caused by infectious agents. Um, these um, burden estimates can help raise awareness and inform uh, investment in prevention programs. We do have well-established prevention tools now and even WHO targets for prevention of HPV and hepatitis related cancers and indeed HIV control. Uh, um, and even other uh, carcinogenic in infections do have the potential to be preventable and treatable if, if we develop the tools. However, even if we have the tools, I just want to leave with the message that you know, many implementation questions do remain uh, in order to improve the, the impact even of uh, existing proven interventions. And perhaps this is where many uh, of you are going to be focusing uh, your future scientific careers, I, I imagine. So I would leave it there and just like to say that some of this work can be found at this IARC resource on, online, the, the Cancer Causes um, website for infections, which is part of the Global Cancer Observatory program run at IARC. And I'd just like to thank the other IARC colleagues that have contributed a lot of this. Thank you. Thanks for your lecture. Uh, really, I have a question, maybe two questions about H. pylori. Um, the global burden of H. pylori infection is much more than uh, this number because most of the cases that have H. pylori, they have subclinical uh, disease. So it means they have the infection, but without any uh, clinical symptoms. So uh, my question is that if 
the treatment for H. pylori eradication is very simple, dual antibiotic plus proton pump inhibitor with a two weeks uh, treatment, and I think it's available in most parts of the world, and it's cheap. Uh, should it be given at somewhat of age as a prophylactic uh, dose? Because most of the patients, they don't have any symptom, and there could be uh, infection in the background. And this chronic infection without any symptom may be uh, a precursor for developing gastric cancer in the future. This is the first question, and the second question would be, is there any strains of H. pylori that carry a higher risk of developing gastric cancer, or there's no difference between them? Okay, I'll answer the second question first, because I think that's easier. Yes, there are certain strains, those that uh, uh, sort of KGA positive, I'm not an expert myself, but there are certain strains that have, have more, more risk. Um, and they maybe could be used in risk stratification strategies. But your question about to what extent can we broaden the, uh, the, the treatment, uh, you're suggesting even moving to prophylaxis. But even, if, even, if, if, even in a scenario where we imagine uh, testing for Helicobacter pylori and treating all of, all of the positives, I think there's, that's, uh, even in that scenario, I think there is questions about um, what is the what is the the, the potential uh, adverse effects of, of of use of so much antibiotics in, in the population and and that and those would also be targeting folks that are most at risk so i think you have to we have to compromise between between um what is uh what is feasible and what, and what is effective and um, so focusing doing a test and only treating those that are that are positive which are programs that are actually now being um, put into place um, in certain high-risk settings, even low-middle income countries. For example, there's a program in, 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 in Bhutan, for example, where they are doing exactly that. Um, what age, I think you mentioned the word age, age is also critical um, because prophylactic treatment in a young age, for example, um, would not be efficient if people were re reinfected later on in their lives um, after the prophylactic treatment. So there's also a question of what age do we intervene to get the biggest, you know, the biggest return for our, for our buck. But really, I think it does go through more um, only treating probably people who have evidence of the, of, the, of the bacteria, because also you need to make sure that people go through with that treatment, you know, and if, if people just don't, if people are not committed to that treatment, then, that, then you have even more potential issues of, of raising um, antibiotic resistance. And of course, people who know that they've got the virus, uh, the, um, the bacteria are also more likely to, be, to, be, uh, to go along with the treatment and also to be able to be followed up carefully to make sure they follow. So I hope that gives a answer. Yes, please. Thank you for your elaborate discussion. My question is the uh, HPV DNA test uh, in cervical cancer as because the 16 strain is the most of uh, the cause of cervical cancer. Is there is any um, cheap or simple uh, test to detect the HPV DNA test either um, by, from the cervical smear or from uh, blood immunoglobulin? Because in the low resource setting, the HPV DNA test is uh, costly. And uh, according to WHO for elimination of cervical cancer, HPV DNA test is the precise test to detect the infection. So my question is that. So you mentioned cervical smears and blood. Uh, let's take the, the blood question. We do not have, unfortunately, a good test for HPV and blood, um, which which makes everything else more difficult. And that's why we need to rely upon cervical smears for screening programs. Um, there is uh, increasing effort to make HPV testing uh, cheaper and more, more um, um, point of care. Um, and, uh, you know, but it, it still is costly for many, for many countries, even, even, the even what we have available to us, to us right now. Um, Ways to improve that are organization, bulk buying, 
you know, uh, and negotiations for for test. But it's even it, it goes beyond the test. A screening program is much more than just the test as well. It requires it does require appropriate follow up and and, and organisation of the health system, which also account it needs to be costed and organised. So it's true um, that. Uh, there, there is there are many factors that need to to go into what is appropriate the screening program but hpv testing is more performant it is more cost effective if you can do it and and there are ways and we hope that we will be reducing the tests in the future and we continue to be a, a lot of work to try to to find cheaper alternatives to even the current test that we that we have available but they need to stay robust they need to keep robust you know that's the problem they need to be reproducible um and uh, to a certain extent uh, standardized uh um that and accredited by to a certain extent uh, commercial companies so there is a, a need also to keep things very uh, controlled Uh, thank you for your lecture. Um, actually, I'm from Libya, and uh, have you seen in the in the map? The Lib Libya is the only um, country in North Africa that has started the vaccination for HP HPV. And uh, um, we are now conducting a study uh, on the prevalence. They started before doing a nationwide study. So my question is. Um, we, are, we don't know yet, so the results might turn that the prevalence is very low. So do you suggest that we still continue the vaccination program or we should stop? So some of those, that, that, I mean, that, that, that map gave, uh, is, is a very simplistic uh, sort of version of which countries have implemented and which countries have not. Um, I've never understood exactly um, the extent to which that data is, is, is followed up or indeed uh, I think it's a simplification because there's also broad differences in coverage in those programs or the success of those programs and some of those programs may have been announced and even kicked off but perhaps were not very successful at, at a population level so I, I must admit I, I'm not very familiar with the program particularly in uh, in Libya uh, and uh, but uh, cervical uh, HPV does exist, ev does exist everywhere, and there we have done HPV prevalence surveys in also in, in that part of the world, not in not in Libya. So, but uh, this, it's true that and, and you're you probably not even got very good. I mean, don't, what extent do you have cervical cancer incidence? I mean, it's really the cervical cancer incidence data that should be that you should be leaning on to making decisions about about um, implementation of vaccines rather than prevalence of HPV in the population, which can change, which can be, um, which can, there can be difficulties in the way we collect the data, maybe not representative. So I think always it's probably worth relying upon what we can do in terms of preventing cervical cancer rather than looking at the, the, the prevalence of HPV in, in the population. The issue is we are conducting the study to convince uh, those people who are opposing because they say uh, it's expensive, you know, the vaccination and all this. And so... Oh, because uh, it's, yeah, okay, so it's not a government-funded program. It's, it's, no, it's not. It's, uh, yeah, okay, I know okay. the, 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 the vaccination is government-funded, but the research, what we are doing, is funded by a, a company. I mean, the vaccination, actually, the MSD, the funding this project. Um, but we are. Uh, I'm thinking, if the results turn that there is no, there are no cases or of the vaccine of the infection, what will happen? Because they don't they don't consider that the vaccine should be given because of the incidence of cervical cancer, but because yeah, because there is infection or not. So I don't know how how this issue should be solved. So it's, it's more. Cervical cancer instance is, is more comparable across across uh, countries because it's, it's it's harder data when you it's a stronger outcome when you when you have it. Um, HPV when you're gaining HPV prevalence data, you just need to be very careful about how you compare it with other studies that has been done with different population sets, or uh, or different um, or different tests and so forth. So. But it, I mean, it's true. There are certain parts of the world where cervical cancer instance is lower than others, and uh, and HP, and it and it is probably driven by underlying differences in HPV prevalence. So I, there, there there may well be places where where HPV vaccination is less 
cost effectiveness, cost effective than, than others. Sure, um, there is that, there is a gradient. Um, Hello. <clears throat> Uh, my question is, do you estimate the mortality from cancer caused by infections? Uh, if so, how does it compare to mortality from cancers not caused by infection? I mean, in the same site. Thank you. Okay, so, I mean, the way we do these global estimates, I mean, they are sort of best estimates and we, and we do what we can to um, how to, to extrapolate. Um, with using the best data that we have available uh, and what we often have to do we have to group by we, we use country specific data if we can if on attributable fractions and, and and cancer estimates often we have to rely on regional amounts of data and then pooling uh, sort of doing meta-analysis type work to to come up with a regional um, attributable fraction or sometimes we're just in a scenario where we have to just use a global attributable fraction because we only have very few studies that are there. And the reason why I want to say it like that is that we are applying these attributable fractions to incidents and we would have to apply the same uh, attributable fractions also to mortality data. Um, we do not, we are not able to have a, a different methodology um, that, uh, that allows us to judge um, whether there's a difference in, um, in mortality in, by, 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 can, by the infection um, etiologically driven cancers to the, to the equivalent in the, in the non-infectious. We would be p applying exactly the same paths to, to the mortality to the mortality data. So, so you, we wouldn't, given our limitations with the global data in this kind of approach, we would not come up with a different picture because we just do not have the, 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 the way to, to determine whether uh, the, 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 the infection-related cancers post-diagnosis are more, uh, are more, have lower survival or higher survival than the others. So, we cannot address that problem. I mean, I think more uh, specific studies done in places where there is better clinical follow-up um, on survival uh, could do that. Um, but you really need individual level data on the infection at diagnosis and really um, survival and mortality by, by infectious status. We know that there are differences in certain cancers like oropharynx for example where the hpv related oral pharynx are have higher have higher um, survival and better outcomes and that may be the case for some other for some other cancers but that's the only real scenario where i think we 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 have enough data to probably uh, yeah that would change the picture from incidence to mortality thank you okay Thank you for your interesting um, presentation. My question um, is related to the number of dose of um, for the vaccination of HPV. I was a little bit confused because at some point, I think you said in UK they wanted to give one dose or two dose. I just wanted to know, like, what is the so most a, common? Okay, so there's been a shift in the in the in the optimism and the evidence base. Okay. There's a huge increase in the evidence base and the optimism about the extent to which a single dose of HPV can give mm -hmm. it equivalent protection to that of two doses. Already we've moved from two to two from three originally because of the evidence base and the optimism and, yeah. the, and the scientific judgment. Um, so uh, already largely based on IAC data, there has been a permissive move from WHO saying um, that countries that want to or can, can, can afford to can, should think about using just a single dose of HPV and and perhaps and if there's any evidence that arises in the future to say, to say that a second dose is required and then then maybe change but now it is ready to go to one to to one for countries that are implementing okay. the UK is a different scenario because that's one of those countries that has been okay implementing vaccine for 15 years or, or longer 
but they have um, made uh, judgments about the, the scientific evidence on one dose and, uh, and, and made modeling of effectiveness, cost effectiveness, and, the, and, and, and advised it to the, to the government um, about the, the opportunity to shift to, to, to one dose. And there has been recently uh, the decision that their, their, their national program will shift from September this year to offering only a single dose. Okay. Obviously, they are coming from a position where they've been offering, well, since 15 years, three doses and then two doses. And so there's less and less HPV circulating in their populations because they've been through the whole process from three to two to one. But right now, the UK and even and, and some other settings are, are, are shifting their regular nationwide programs, even in high income settings, to only having one single HPV dose. Okay. So I will be giving my, my daughter's 14 uh, in here in France, and, and I will only be giving her a single dose of HPV vaccine. Okay, thank you very much. I don't know how much time we have left or questions from YouTube or... Thank minutes. Ten minutes. Yeah. But no, no question from the... from YouTube, right? But maybe another question here? Please. Yeah, thanks for a great discussion. In fact, I am particularly interested by the involvement of physiobacterium nucleatum in colorectal carcinogenesis. In? Colorectal carcinogenesis. You know, the famous physiobacterium nucleatum currently evolving as a new bacterium um, involved in the whole steps of uh, colorectal cancer, even in metastasis. So do we have any evidence to support the involvement of this new bacterium as a risk factor for colorectal cancer, in addition to all what we know about it? So I am learning fast as well about uh, the... Are you talking about Clostridium... Uh... No, physiobacterium nucleatum. Physiobacteria. Well, so I am, I, I must admit, I'm not an expert myself on, on colorectal cancer, but there are some various signals. I understand that the research is, uh, there's very interesting signals about certain bacterium. I don't know necessarily the physiobacterium, but even perhaps even more specific species that may be uh, associated with colo colorectal cancer risk. I mean, the work on um, colorectal cancer and, and, and uh, the, the, the vast microbiome, I think, is, is moving fast. Uh, we are, I think, there's, there's, the, 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 how strong those associations are uh, yet, and we, the comparability across different studies and so forth, uh, I, I, I'm not sure how strong the evidence is, is yet, but I think that is a, a domain where um, we are going to be seeing uh, more and more data arising in the, in the, in the coming years, uh, both on looking for the bacteria themselves in, in cancer patients and, and, and health in, and cancer-free patients, and indeed uh, looking at the genetic uh, mutations that are caused by these um, that are known to be caused by these uh, bacteria in, in, in these cancers. So I think that's an involving field. Um, the, I don't think we are now yet at a, at a level to say that we have clear evidence of a, of a strong association for any one particular bacteria in, in colorectal cancer. But we are seeing some you know, upticks in, in colorectal cancers in, in, in young people, early onset in particular. Uh, so, you know, something seems to be changing there. Um, could it be, could it be uh, an infection or could it be uh, a bacterium? I think that's an open question, uh, an important one. Yeah. Yes, please. Yeah, thank you for a great lecture. I have a simple question. Like, usually the patient who have HBV or HCV, or uh, Many cases they have co-infections like HPV with HCV or HCD, HPV uh, and HAV. Like there's a lot of cases who have a co-infection. In this case, then how can we calculate the tribute fractions? How to divide the effects like HPV and HCV? If they have co-infection, it can be a synergy effect. So. Your, I mean, the, that that is more concerning. Yeah, I mean, you do. We do have um, uh, some of these agents cause the same 
cancers. Yeah. I think perhaps what you're referring to is particularly hepatitis B virus and hepatitis C virus as, as, as causal agents of, of liver cancer, for example. Yeah. Um, so there, are, there, there, is, there is some synergy um and uh but what we have to, what the methodology that we tend to use here and i didn't go into the individual cancer sites because it's a bit too much methodology about how we, how we do the paths but you know we 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 basically um just uh, uh, take the the prevalence of the, the prevalence of these of these viruses in cancer cases which means that the co-infection um part is is is, is much lower because uh there it's, it's only a small fraction and we can actually we actually part we we share that co-infection half and half or, or or based on the proportion of the, the 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 people who are singularly infected with hbv and singularly affected with hcv and liver cancer within that same country or within that same study so we proportionally separate it out based on what we know in in people who are not co-infected that's our simple procedure for 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 uh for uh handling that issue there um, then it means like the patient who have uh, both then they consider both percolation right no we like i say we, we would split it out so you know for example if you had how can i say so 50 in 50 percent of people of liver cancer cases have a hepatitis b virus and and 10 percent have hepatitis c and then one percent have both yeah. then that one percent we would we would distribute five to one uh. hepatitis b to hepatitis c in, in, in a very simple manner for this kind of global attribution work yeah, but what we know from individual epidemiological studies is that the the, 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 the synergistic risk does does exist in, in an individual but that that's a bit different from this kind of work to 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 raise global awareness and it doesn't count twice where the problem does count twice um is if we're in a scenario like hiv because hiv only provokes cancer with an underlying uh, uh viral carcinogen so we cannot just add the attributable burden of HIV to the other types because the, for example, the, the increasing risk uh, for cervical cancer in, in, in sub-Saharan African populations that are due to HIV, it's all HPV related disease and it will be uh, eradicatable by, by HPV vaccination. You will not have it there. On the other hand, it is also attributable to HIV because in the absence of HIV, you would not have had that excess risk of cervic of, of HPV related disease. So that's a scenario where we have this, um, um, we have these causes that cannot be counted twice. You cannot add them to the, to, to each other. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, there's one question on the YouTube channel from Abu Bakari Jalu from Ghana. Um, who asked, how do we communicate this important information to policymakers uh, to ensure their commitment to implementing sustainable solutions to cancer prevention? Well, I mean, certainly we, we like to build these, this evidence for, uh, on, on the global burden to be able to, 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 to give, raise awareness for absolute numbers of cases. And, and, and what the next step to this, I think, is, is putting it into models of effectiveness to be able to, 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 to really capture that this is the kind of burden that can be removed by action now. I mean, that often requires projection on using effectiveness or cost effectiveness. Um, and, and, and lives lost. So it, it is the basis of, 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 further, of, further, of further communication. Um, but, it, the, but it's tricky. I mean, for example, I think you need to, to it needs to be, um, it needs to be uh, framed in terms of, of absolute numbers of, of, of cancers that can be avoided. And eventually, if the possibility to look at cost effectiveness of acting today on on uh, using the 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 
the prevention tools that we have available to us today. Okay. Thank you. This was really good, Gary. And um, thank you again for this lecture. <laughs>